welcome everybody thank you so much um so yes um i just wanted to point out before we get started i have put a handout into the chat so if you go into the chat you should be able to see it's entitled bell house webinar handout and you just click on that link and you should be able to download a pdf which has got clickable links in there of the resources i will refer to um this evening um, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, if anyone gets stuck with that, I know um, Anna and Lizzie will help us out with that. Um, um, sorry, Ruth, sorry, I'm getting my, my names mixed up. Um, so I, <clears throat> I'm going to start off by sharing my screen and then we get started with the presentation. We are going to be doing an interactive presentation this evening, so I really want you to get all get involved. Um, hopefully you can all see that uh, clearly. Um, Anna or Ruth, do let me know if that's work or not working. Um, so uh, this is the title of our uh, talk tonight. We're going to be talking about trauma and neurodiversity, but specifically with reference to executive functioning, because that is my area of expertise. And we are going to be having an interactive presentation. Um, so you can join in two ways to the interactive nature of it. You can use the QR code, which is currently on the screen. So you can open your camera on your phone and scan in, uh, we'll just have the camera open and it should bring up the URL to link you straight through and you won't need to en enter any codes. If you can't use the QR codes or if you'd prefer to do it on your computer browser, go to menti.com. So that's www.menti.com and enter the code 61 62 47 80. That's 61 62 47 80. And that should take you to um, the screen um, where you should be able to kind of like this page, hopefully, um, and that we should start seeing those come up. Oh, there we go. There we go. We've got two people liking it already. If anyone's getting stuck with that, um, could one of the facilitators this evening just put the code in the chat? It will come up at the top of all the interactive uh, slides, but it would be just helpful to have that there. So 61 62 47 80 m the URL is www.menti.com. Great stuff. So we'll get started. If it will let me go to the next slide. There we go. So um, the schedule. Uh, the schedule for this talk is um, we're going to be, first of all, telling you about the handout with the clickable hyperlinks. Please do take a look at that. There's lots of fabulous resources on there and should mean that you can actually really engage with the interactive nature because there's a lot of notes on there for you already. Um, we're going to be doing a Q&A at the end. And the aims of this talk are for you to understand what executive functions are, the neuroscience between executive functions and trauma. And then we're going to have a little bit of an introduction to the support, um, how we can support the development of strong executive functions, because that's really important to and really links closely into the trauma piece too. So um, you're all here because you support neurodiverse children. Maybe they've got dyslexia, maybe they've got ADHD, maybe they've got ASD, maybe they've got a combination. But I would like you to describe in three words the children that you support. So whether it's your own children or, or whether it's uh, children that you support professionally um, or as a volunteer, you could describe them in three words. So go to the menti.com and put in your three words. They should create a lovely word cloud for us here. All the attributes of the children that we support. So they can be challenges that they face or they can be uh, more positive attributes that they have. Um, I have <laughs> one very neurodiverse um, 10 year old. Um, she, um, she has ADHD and she really struggles with her emotional regulation. So I would say she's um, emotional, a creative, and um, she can also be quite um, flippant. There we go, there's some words I would use to describe her. Okay, emotional, creative, and anxious, good. <laughs> Dramatic, unique, wonderful, super. See if we can get a few more coming up. Super. Accelerating. Complicated. Creative coming up. Thinks outside the box. Let's see if we get any more coming up. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, oh, 
there we go, got a couple more coming up. Um, it is, you will get the most out of this evening's talk if you do get involved in the interactive element. And I see we've got, um, we've got 14 people online today. So it would be great to have a few more responses because it just really helps to, to get a sense of, um, of, of what we're talking about this evening and helps you to learn as well. That's why we, we do the interactive element. Okay, so a little bit of an introduction to me and why I'm here speaking to you today. So my name's Victoria Bagnall. Um, I'm dyslexic, uh, I have a diagnosis of dyslexia, but despite my challenges with dyslexia, um, I have extremely strong goal-directed persistence, which is an executive function skill. Um, and there was nothing that was gonna stop me getting to Cambridge University, where I uh, suffered from uh, severe discrimination um, because of my neurodiversity. I was quite bruised by the experience, to say the least. Um, vowed never to go into academia again, never to do anything to do with education. Um, but I was doing uh, some teaching English as a foreign language um, as part of a sabbatical. Uh, fell in love with teaching and decided to go back and do my PGCE. Um, so I'm a trained geography teacher um, and I'm also a mother of three gorgeous girls um, who's two, five and ten. So I really get what it's like to, to raise neurodiverse young ladies. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Connections in Mind uh, and also one of the co-founders of an organisation called The Code that does um, executive functional aware tutoring, um, which is more um, academic based than the coaching that we do, which is more practical. So I want to talk to you a little bit about my light bulb moment and I hope you guys tonight are going to have your own light bulb moment um, this evening because that's what we're all about at Connections of Mind is helping people to understand the importance of executive functioning in their neurodiverse uh, children's lives. So for me when I was growing up because of my neurodiversity, because of my dyslexia um, and because of my executive function challenges which I didn't know what they were at the time um, I grew up thinking that I was lazy, I was disorganized, that I really just wasn't good enough as a human being. And I got this feedback from quite a few people, not just from my parents, but from also from my school, from organizations like the guides that I would join. I really struggled to just do the basic things. People could tell I was intelligent, but they couldn't understand why I really struggled to do what they saw as basic things. And this led in my early adulthood to repeated um, psychological crisis in terms of uh, my mental health. And I really felt a lot like this lady here um, in the circle, kind of going around in circles, tying myself in knots, that feeling of not being good enough and not being valued is, is really difficult to, to grow up with. But <laughs> it, I, I am happy to say that since I have found out about executive functions, I don't have these challenges so much anymore with my mental health, because I now understand that what I was, the challenges I was facing were to do with the way that my brain is wired and not because I'm a bad person. And so um, I had a bit of a light bulb moment when I was working. So I did my teacher training um, as a geography teacher, unfortunately suffered a lot of discrimination um, as a teacher, because of my poor spelling and my dyslexia, which was very unfortunate, left the teaching profession and became a tutor working on one-on-one -on -one with young people with executive function challenges. I didn't know that's what they were at the time, but children with, with SEN. And I was working on one very confusing case of a young lady who perhaps like myself was very bright. Um, she was much brighter than me. Um, she got the highest ever score in the Oxford Thinking Skills Assessment. And she couldn't access the academics. She could, she's very, very bright, she could do it, but she just couldn't, she was so anxious about her performance. She couldn't complete an essay, she couldn't organize her thoughts, but verbally she was off the scale brilliant. Um, and so she was a very confusing case because you could tell she was intelligent, but why couldn't she do these basic things? And I was working on this particular case and the psychiatrist on the case because she had severe mental health challenges as a result of this. She recommended that I read this book that had just been published a few years earlier um, called Smart But Scatter Teens. I really recommend it to you. You can find a link to it on our reading and resources page, which is on, there's a link to it on the final page of, of our handout that I've given you this evening. 
Um, it's a fantastic book full of strategies of what you can do to help children with executive function challenges, especially teenagers. And there's another book for teens and there's one for adults as well. Written by this wonderful woman, Peg Dawson, who has since become my mentor. She's the most generous um, person that I know, <laughs> professional that I know. She's so generous with her knowledge and always at the end of an email if I have a challenge within connections of mind that we need to think through. Um, so um, it was really this light bulb moment where I decided to get on, a, I was reading this book and I decided I've got to get on a plane and I've got to go and meet Peg Dawson. So I went over to Boston um, and went to a training that she was hosting, um, took her out for lunch, said, please come to the UK. You need to come to the UK. We need to learn about this. And we arranged for her to do that. And I held the first ever training of executive function coaches where I met my future partners um, at Connections in Mind. Dr. Patina Honan and Imogen Moore Shelley. And our mission is quite simply to change the world. This is a small mission, but we really believe in the power of having that light bulb moment and really understanding the importance of our executive functioning in our development, in our behavior, in so many different areas of our lives so that we can really understand that it's not, it's not that we're bad people, that we just, our brains are wired differently and that we, there's things we can work on, um, but it's important to, to rationalize it in a way that doesn't mean that we're bad people. And our mission alongside changing the world um, is to support people to overcome their challenges because we know that it's gonna take a long time for everyone in the world to have that light bulb moment. So in the meantime, we're gonna be supporting people so that they can overcome their challenges they face as a result of their executive function challenges uh, and they can be the best that they can be. So, talked a little bit about executive functions, don't worry, I'm gonna get onto the importance of trauma in a minute, but I really want to know your knowledge of executive functions because that will help me to pitch the next few slides. So if you could just answer this question, Rate your, rate your knowledge. Have you never heard of executive functions before? Have you, do you feel like you're a bit of an expert or do you feel like you're somewhere in the middle? So just use the slider there so we can, I can get an idea of where we're at. Great stuff. Good, look at that. Good knowledge already. Super. That's so helpful. Thank you so much to everyone who's filled that up. So you can see there's um, at least one person here who's never heard of them before um, and a few people that have a sound knowledge and um, leading up to kind of quite a lot of knowledge about executive function. So I am going to cover up what they are because of the people here that, that don't know. Um, but also I'm going to focus on some of the higher uh, learning for those people who, who already know what they are too. So Executive functions are cognitive processes, so that means brain functions, brain processes, which reside in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is the bit of our brain behind our forehead. And they are responsible for the effective and timely execution of tasks, which is why they're called executive functions. It's not because if you develop strong executive functions, you're going to be a CEO, although it really helps because you need to get things done to be a CEO, but executive is, is to do with execution, getting things done. And how do we know about them? Well, a lot of people come to me and say, when I'm rattling on about a dinner party or a drinks party or um, down at the school playground when, <laughs> when mums are picking up or mums and dads are picking up, and they say, well, you know, if they're so fundamental, then why don't I know about them already? Um, and that's because scientists only really discovered recently that executive functions are cognitive processes and not character flaws in the last 20 years since they've been able to use those MRI scanners and be able to see what part of the brain is, go, is, is being used and to see that this is um, a part of the brain that is responsible for this. So it's to do with how the brain is developed, not to do with that person's character. And everybody is affected. So we have trained almost a thousand teachers now and not a single one of those teachers had a perfect profile. In fact, no one that has ever completed our questionnaire 
has a perfect profile. And you'll see um, in the handout there on the first page there, there's a link to the questionnaire for yourself and for your children as well. So do fill that out. It's completely free and it creates um, a bespoke report for you as well. What does it actually mean, executing tasks? What does that mean? It seems quite high level, doesn't it? But actually it's all these basic things that we need to do every day in our lives. So things like meeting deadlines, prioritizing the work to be completed, regulating our emotions so we don't fly off the handle, inhibiting our responses, organizing our belongings, organizing our thoughts in pap on paper in terms of an essay or a letter or an email, holding information in our heads, that's our working memory, which is often a, um, a severe challenge with, with children who are neurodiverse, keeping time or the ability to estimate time and how long it's going to take to get something done and how many of us have children who really struggle with getting started on their homework because they think it's going to take hours but actually it only takes them five minutes and so that concept of time is difficult for them. Thinking flexibly um, and the ability to shift and change depending on the change in circumstances so that can be really unsettling for a lot of neurodiverse children. So these are the challenges. So thinking about your child now, or if you're here for yourself, your, yourself, which of these challenges, again, you can choose as many as you like, which of these challenges do you face on a daily basis or on a regular basis? It's going to bring up a nice donut in the middle there when people start filling it out. There we go. There's the first one. Super. Really interesting. The regulating emotions is coming up really high and the prioritizing the work to be completed. That's, yeah, really fundamental. Meeting deadlines is also a big one. But it's really interesting. It's a really across the board, isn't it? There's lots of these different executive functions and all these things are linked to our executive functions super duper great thank you so much for completing that i think that just really just helps us to understand how relevant all of this is to to our everyday lives so i want to talk now about the difference between the executive functions and the executive function skills because we talk about both at connections in mind so there's a lot of research and discourse within academia about executive functioning. Um, you know, there's whole conferences on it you can go to and there's a lot of debate that goes on. Um, but the, the general agreement is that there's these three core brain functions. Um, they're not in little drawers like separate in, the, in, in, our, in our forehead, but they are kind of intermingled within the prefrontal cortex. But the prefrontal cortex is responsible for cognitive flexibility, our ability to to shift our thinking from one way to another, our inhibitory control, so our ability to not do something we know we shouldn't do, and then our working memory, our ability to hold information in our head. So that's what our prefrontal cortex does. It does those functions. But what that means in everyday life is it they kind of cross over and they result in these 11 executive function skills that you can kind of put your finger on or shine a pointer on and say, these are the things that I need to work on or my child needs to work on. So we cover things like we've talked about the working memory, we've talked about the response inhibition, talked about the flexibility, but things like organization. And by organization, we mean organizing your belongings, keeping things tidy. Um, Goal-directed persistence, that's resilience or grit. That is an executive function skill sustained attention, the ability to concentrate for a long time, time management, metacognition, our ability to self-evaluate and see how our behavior is impacting those around us, task initiation, getting started on that homework, that's a huge one, planning and prioritization, what bit of homework do I need to do first, what, how do I make a decision, all of these things, emotional control coming in there as well, so all of these executive function skills, these are the things that we can tangibly say, isolate and say that's what this young person needs to work on so that's what the question I will do will help you to identify which of those specific skills we need to work on and executive function skills are absolutely fundamental for all elements of learning so that's why it's so so important for everyone to do with education to understand about executive functioning um, and, and but it's all all areas of life but you know academics is so important for our young people because they're in school so much of their lives um, so the ability to um, stop yourself from calling out and put your hand up 
that's to do with response inhibition, the ability to self-reflect and self-evaluate, that's metacognition, the ability to write an essay and plan and prioritize what should go in, to organize your thoughts, um, the ability to do your homework, to get started on it, the ability to revise, and the ability to sit an exam. There's so many executive function skills just wrapped up in everything to do with school. And so you can see how if you have challenges in these areas, you are at an unfair disadvantage because schools don't specifically teach these skills. They kind of expect them to happen by osmosis, um, which they don't for everybody. Um, and so that's, for, for me, very unfair. I'm just going to talk a little bit about neurodiversity and executive functions now. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on these slides, but I just want to point out the links between the two. So there's a lot of um, research around executive functioning coming out very, very recently. But to do with ADHD and executive functions, uh, Professor Russell Barclay is the foremost researcher in this field. And so about 10 years ago, almost now, um, he published a paper saying that ADHD is actually also self-regulation deficit disorder and executive function deficit disorder. It's all about the prefrontal cortex with ADHD. Um, and, and it talked about how we can develop our executive functions by modifying the environment and making accommodation so it's not fixed. But also there's a really strong link with dyslexia too, and this is really important because often people think, oh, it's just the ADHD, but as we know, as we're neurodiverse parents, there's not, you're not just kind of in a silo, okay, it's just a literacy challenge, there's, there's all sorts of other things going on there too. And so this research in 2004, as early as 2004, showed that there was a really strong link between executive function challenges um, and dyslexia. And then more recently, uh, they're beginning to find that actually the executive functioning challenges are in underpinning many neurodiverse conditions. And actually, that's probably the cause, the, the, the cognitive cause of these neurodiverse conditions. And um, this was a really interesting piece of re research from two and a bit years ago um, about reading. And you would think kind of dyslexia, okay, that's the literacy challenge. But actually what they're beginning to find is that there's a lot to do with the processing and the working memory and the visual attention, which is all executive functioning. And it's difficult to separate those out from the literacy piece. Um, and so they're advising that approaches to do with executive functioning can be really helpful for the, even the literacy part of dyslexia too. So <laughs> there's that kind of, um, information about neurodiversity. There's also links with all sorts of other Tourette's and AD, ASD and all sorts of different neurodiverse conditions. But that was just a, a little bit of a peek into that. Um, but I would like to ask the audience now, they think is the age range when the human brain is considered to be fully mature. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really interesting there. Um, that 21 to 25 is coming up uh, the highest. Um, even someone with 11 to 15 there. Um, so interestingly, the human brain doesn't fully mature for neurotypical brains. And, and remember that neurodiverse conditions are neurodevelopmental. So that means that if you're neurodiverse, your brain develops later chronologically, although it's, it's difficult to say it's a chronological thing, but it so neuro, neurotypical um, brains develop in the late 20s. Um, and so with our neurodiverse children, we're talking about the early 30s and into their 30s before their brains are fully mature. And that's a lot to do with our executive functioning. So I'm just gonna talk through the development of the executive functions now. So at those kind of toddler years, the, the, those initial executive functions, the working memory, the cognitive flexibility and response inhibition start coming online. And you start seeing in terms of like object permanence, you know, where the, the toddler will, will chuck something off of their, um, their um, high chair and, and they won't notice that it's gone. And then all of a sudden they start noticing that it's gone. They start looking and then they play that game where they keep throwing things off their high chair and mommy has or whoever's looking after the young person has to pick it up and put it back on and it's a great game. That object permanence is the working memory starting to form. Um, also the not crying when mommy leaves the room, uh, response inhibition um, and, and so on and so forth. So you can see, you know, in 
in those toddler years, you can see these executive functions developing. Then at primary school years, things like our emotional control, sustained detection and flexibility mean that we can access learning within a primary school environment um, for neurotypical people, but for, for people who struggle with this area, this might be more difficult for them to, to develop these particular skills. Then the skills of task initiation, so that's the opposite of procrastination, planning and prioritizing organization don't really come online until we're midway through our secondary school years. Um, and again, that's for neurotypicals. Um, but interestingly, and most difficultly, I think <laughs> for me, um, the time management, goal-directed persistence and metacognition don't fully mature in neurotypical brains until our late 20s. And so we are asking a lot of children, uh, whether they're neurotypical or neurodiverse, to do a lot of higher cognitive functions when they're not ready to do them yet. And so these high stakes exams that we have at GCSE um, and A-level at, at that, those before or even in the twenties is asking, it's really setting up for those people who have abnormally strong executive functions or they've developed abnormally fast um, to do well. Uh, and I believe that if you look at the examination system now is those people who have very strong executive functions do really well in exams and those who, who don't really struggle. And, and sometimes they have a huge intelligence that they can kind of overcome all of that and, and it gets lost for a while, but it does come unstuck at some point. And what we tend to find is that those children who are very intelligent manage to get through their GCSEs because they are very bright. But when it gets to A-levels, the wheels come off because they have to do a lot of independent learning and they really can't access the learning in the same way as their peers. So it's really interesting the way that the education system is set up. <clears throat> but <laughs> the, the important thing to take away from this evening is we can all change our brains. So neuroplasticity is a thing. I'm going to show a little video now and there's access to this on your handout so that you can use this with the young people as well. So here we go. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain was pretty much fixed after childhood. But recent advances now tell us they were mistaken. The brain can, and does, change throughout our lives. We can mould it like plastic. Hence neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. But how does neuroplasticity work? Our brain is a bit like a computer circuit board. There are billions of pathways sending messages every time you feel, do, or think something. Some of these pathways are like super highways. These are our habits, our embedded ways of being. Every time we think in a familiar way, complete a particular task, or feel a certain emotion, we widen the pathway and it becomes easier for our brains to send these messages. Now, if we think about something from another perspective, try a new task, or choose a different emotion, we start treading a new pathway. And if we keep using that path, it gets wider and smoother, becoming a super highway. And this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway is bypassed and deteriorates. This is neuroplasticity in action. No matter how old we are, we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. It takes effort and regular repetition, but everyone can rewire their brains to create new superhighways. Okay, so hopefully you managed to, to get that. And as I say, the link is available for you um, on your hand, I think on the last page as well. But just, you know, showing how the neuroscience is very, very clear. It takes lots of effort. I am not trivializing the effort that it needs to make a change, but we can all do that. And the next slide that I'm going to show you, um, hopefully, <laughs> if it will let me, hello. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you is about the rule of 60. And this is really, really important thing to remember in our role supporting young people to develop stronger executive functions, is that 
these things seem like simple things, okay? Because we can do them, we find them easy. Um, but it's just the same cognitive process as learning any new skill, learning to ride a bike, learning to play tennis, learning to drive a car. All of these things take time and regular repetition. And the research shows, there was a, a, a research paper done in, um, I think again in 2012, um, Philippa Lally um, at UCL. And she found in her research that on average, it takes 60 iterations of a task before it becomes automatic, before you form that habit. And that is the same with developing our executive function skills, the strategies that we embed. So whilst it may seem simple stuff, that doesn't mean it's easy to do and it doesn't mean it can just happen overnight. You've got to stick at it for those 60 iterations. And the irony is that if you have executive function challenges, that goal-directed persistence may not be as strong as in neurotypical brains and so it may be less easy for you to keep going it also might get distracted because sustained attention is an issue you might forget what you're needing to do because of working memory and so the, the spiral kind of continues but we can change it takes lots of effort and it takes support in order to do that but we're here this evening because we want to know about the effect of trauma and stress on our brains specifically regarding our executive function because that's the part of the brain that it really impacts. So we know from the research, and if you're interested in learning more about this, this is Adele Diamond's research. Um, she's a foremost research in specifically into executive functions globally based out of Canada. So Professor Adele Diamond did lots of research and has worked out that stress, exercise that we, jo we find joyful. So it's not just exercise for the sake of exercise, but doing things that we find joyful sleep and nutrition are absolutely essential in terms of good executive functioning. And Dan Siegel, who is another um, psychologist and neuroscientist, uh, came up with this hand model of the brain. I'm gonna get you to do this along with me because it's a really useful thing to use with your kids and I use it with my kids every day. So what we've got here is our hand and this part of our wrist here is our brain stem. So that's our instinctual, well, that's our kind of automatic part of our brain, let's say, where our breathing um, and a heartbeat and, and all that kind of stuff happens. Then we've got our emotional part of our brain, which is our limbic brain, which is kind of signified here by the thumb being across the palm of the hand like that. So if you can all do that, sitting there at your computers, <laughs> just having a go at that, but it's like we're in some kind of sect or something, isn't it? And then when you put your fingers, you wrap your fingers over the top there, that is the prefrontal cortex here and the neocortex at the back here. But the prefrontal cortex is controlling the limbic brain. And the limbic brain is our emotional brain, the more instinctual response is that fight, flight or freeze part of our brain. But our executive functions control those responses. That's what they do. They're like the conductor or the air traffic controller of our instincts. Now. If we're stressed, if we haven't slept well, if we haven't eaten well, if we haven't exercised, our executive functions are neurologically disconnected from our more instinctual part of our brain. That's why hangry is a thing. You know, when you, your, your child is really angry just before they, they eat because <laughs> they, they need to eat and so their fight, flight or freeze is taking over and their executive functions are disconnected from that part of their brain. And this is such an important hand model of the brain and I really encourage you to use it with your children. It's a great way of talking about what happens when we lose control of our emotions, which we do as adults too. And it's really important to normalize that. You know, we do fly off the handle as parents. It's okay that that happens. But when we normalize it, when we talk about it, there are certain behaviors that are acceptable when we fly off the handle and the certain aren't. Hitting is not okay. Swearing is not okay. We, whatever the rules are within your house. But you know, harm, certainly harming someone physically or mentally is not okay when we flip our lids and we have to learn a certain level of response inhibition when we're in that flight or flight um, part of our brain in, in order to, to know how to fit into society. So it's not about excusing this behavior, but actually to, to talk about and normalize it. But actually what we need to do is we need to learn as parents and as carers looking after young people with executive function challenges, we need to learn what it is for that child that brings their executive functions, functions back online. Our first element is always time. It takes time. They need to 
use their self-regulation techniques, whatever works for them. For me, it's a long exhale, like blowing out candles, we say in our family. <sighs> yeah, blowing out candles on a birthday cake. That's really good for us personally, but for each family, for each individual, it'd be different. What is that regulation technique to, to bring those executive functions back online? So it takes time and it takes those strategies, but it also takes the support, the co-regulation, support and empathy of a support worker or parent who can sit with the child when they're in that space and be like, it's okay. This is a human reaction to what's happened. It's not okay to hit, That's I won't let you do that, but it is okay to feel angry, sad, frustrated, whatever it is that's caused you to flip your lid. That is okay. So what does this all link with trauma? <laughs> well, I'm getting on to that now because it's really important we have that foundation knowledge before we move on to this. So imagine that you're a child that's growing up in an environment where you are stressed all the time. You haven't eaten well, you're not sleeping well, and you haven't done much exercise. Your executive functions are not going to be connecting neurologically with your um, instincts and you're going to be living in that fight flight or freeze part of your brain and this is um, research that was done by the the Harvard Center for the Developing Child so this isn't just something I've dreamt up this is very clearly research um, and evidenced that basically what happens is that if a child is living in chronic trauma um, then they uh, their executive functions aren't allowed to develop. The brain doesn't allow them to develop in, in the same way as it does um, for people who are not living in a traumatic environment. And so the child's default brain function is the instinctual brain function. And that ability to use those executive functions to get things done is bypassed because the brain just needs to keep that person safe uh, and it's defaulting to that. So in childhood, that can mean that those executive functions just don't develop and that can result in... Um, neurodiverse traits um, and often uh, whilst we know that neurodiversity is genetic absolutely but often trauma, uh, trauma can also cause onset of neurodiverse traits too. Also within adulthood as well and we all talk about brain fog in, in um, COVID and brain fog <laughs> is caused because our executive functions aren't working brilliantly because of the trauma that the brain has experienced um, physically because of living through COVID um, in terms of, you know, we had the infection, but also mentally in terms of living through COVID and what it's done to us in terms of the stress that we've had. And that brain fog, that ability, inability to think clearly is because our executive functions aren't working as well as they perhaps were, were before the pandemic. And so any kind of trauma that we experience as adults can impact our executive functioning too. And the best thing that we can do at that moment when we're experiencing trauma is to not acknowledge that and say, okay, I am going to have difficulty today doing basic things. I need to be kind to myself about that because I'm much more likely to be able to get my executive functions back online if I'm kind to myself than if I'm like, why can't I just do this? Oh, it's so frustrating. Then I'm going to be living much more in my instinctual brain. So learning to self-regulate, learning to be kind to ourselves is the best way that we can move through that trauma and the effect that it has. On our functioning but it's really really important and this is so key to this evening is trauma is something that happens inside of us as a response to an event it is not something that's the same for everyone so if you think about um, the afghan war and you think about all the soldiers that went now some of them came back with ptsd and some of them didn't and that's because, uh, and, and they experience the same thing. And that's because it depends on how it impacts you, your brain and your thinking. So trauma is not something that's fixed. You can't go around measuring trauma and saying, oh, this child's been traumatized and that one hasn't. It depends on the impact. So things that can be traumatic are bullying, um, uh, difficult um, family environment, sibling uh, challenges, um, a teacher that doesn't understand you, so many different things can be traumatic uh, for young people and we need to listen to what they're saying to us about how they're feeling um, because that will be impacting their ability to develop their executive functions. And learning just cannot take place physically, neurologically in the brain when your executive functions are disconnected, when you're living in your fight, flight or freeze part of your brain, you cannot learn. 
And, and if we force children, if we make them sit there when they're having a traumatic experience, it's not gonna work. They have to be in an environment where they feel supported and cared for and safe and they're well fed and they've slept well before they're going to be able to learn. It's so fundamental. And for those of you that come from a teaching background like I do, it is so fundamental. We know this because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is this great model that talks about what you need to have in order, the foundations you need to have in order to be able to improve yourself, to reach your potential. And it starts off with the phys physiological needs, so food, water, warmth, and rest, then the safety needs, safety and security, and then this really key one, this belonging love and love, having rela good relationships and friends, that's so, so important. And then that feeling of like accomplishment and self-confidence can come, but without those foundations, you're never gonna be able to build the esteem, you're never gonna be able to build the self-actualization. So it's really important to remember that as parents and teachers and people supporting children with executive function challenges. If you don't work on the bottom bits of the pyramid, you, the work that you're doing at the top is just never gonna work. You've really got to work on those parts. So safety, connection and belonging and nurture are all fundamental to development and we must prioritize them. It's not just about the well-being piece and all that you know needs to be over there. The well-being piece is absolutely fundamental to making sure that young people can develop in the way that they, they need to. So <laughs> the upshot of all of this is that if you're looking at a school for your young person, if you know that they've had some traumatic experiences at school before, which a lot of neurodiverse children do just because of the system, not because of anyone within the system being particularly mean or they're just not educated, they're just not knowledgeable at, about this. And that's where our, our work has to be to change the world and get to people to know about this stuff. But if you're looking for a school that will be safe for um, your neurodiverse child, find a, a trauma-informed school. Absolutely essential because a trauma-informed school will treat every child as if they are experiencing trauma and it will be a, a level playing field for everyone. And if they can build on those foundations of making sure that they've got all their needs met first before they build on the learning, that will be really fundamental for the development of, of our young people that we be careful. So I'm just coming to the end now, I'm going to talk quickly about what we can do to develop stronger executive functions. And if you want to know more about this, we have lots of courses and um, all sorts of things. So have a look on your handout and then do get in contact with us. Um, there's a step by step guide. I talked about this. You can find these books in the reading and resources. But there's a three step approach that we use at Connections in Mind um, to, to building strong executive functions. The first is to connect. The second is to collaborate and the third is to support. So I'm just gonna quickly run over that and then we'll, we'll get to the Q&A. So connection is all about empathy and empathy is different from sympathy. And it's really important to know the difference between the two and empathy is a really difficult skill to master. So it's not just, oh, you just need to be empathetic, really understand what that means. And we have an empathy course on our website and there's a link to that on the handout. Um, and, and basically what empathy does is it helps recognize, it helps speak to the instinctual part of the brain uh, and helps the executive functions to come back online because that instinctual part of the brain feels heard. And then those executive functions will be able to come on board. So that's why empathy is so, so important. But also executive function literacy is really important too. If you can start talking about these challenges at home, then you can really help young people to understand their challenges, first of all, to self-advocate and then to start developing strategies for themselves that really work for them. I was talking about the blowing the candles out. It's the one that we have at home in terms of our emotional regulation. We find that that really works for us. But working through those things with children is really important. Autonomy is also really important. This is part of our collaborate stage. Children cannot learn these skills if we do it for them. We must give them the opportunity to do that. And that's really hard when you've got a neurodiverse child and you want to keep them safe and you want to make sure that they don't get, have any more traumatic experiences where they might fail or something might go wrong, but we really must put those learning opportunities in their way. Make sure they feel safe, nurtured, well-fed, et cetera, before they get to the learning experience, but do let them to do things independently. It's so, so important. And use questions as well. So questions forge new neural pathways in the brain and help people to think independently. 
if people constantly rely on someone else to do the thinking for them, they won't develop their, their own way of thinking about it and they won't become independent. So it's really important to use questions rather than the directions in our parenting. Russ Barkley uses this quote, which I think is really, really important one. Um, all of this is really important, as you can tell. Um, but we should shepherd and not engineer. We should think of ourselves as parents, as shepherds and not engineers. We're not here to engineer our children. We got the children we got. Um, we can help them, support them, and, and do whatever they need to support them, but we cannot tell them what to do. Um, the, the thing that we know at Connections in Mind is the child must be motivated for change. You cannot, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. And, and this is exactly the same with the shepherd, not engineer. You've got to create that nurturing environment and then they will flourish. Um, it's just like a shepherd, you've got to make sure they're well watered, that they've got a safe environment, they're kept safe from the foxes or the trauma, um, and that they're well fed and they've slept well. Just the same as you would do as a shepherd. That is your responsibility as a parent. And use scaffolding, um, checklists, reminders, post-it notes and routines, but please do that collaboratively with your child. So don't just kind of, one morning they come down ready to school, like, I've got your checklist, here we go, we're gonna do this. No, sit down with them and say, right, okay, when we go to school, you're often forgetting this, this and this, how can we work out a plan to make sure that you remember these things? Um, and they may say, oh, well, we could have a checklist, Okay, great. What things do we need to remember and help them get them to design it and to put nice pictures on it, get them involved in it. They'll be much more likely to do it. And we're here to help. That's we're so passionate, as you can probably tell from our presentation, so passionate about this work. So we're here to help if you need any support with this at all. We have a parent course. There's a link for that on your handout. Um, and we can support young people with coaching. Um, we have expert coaches uh, that we have on our books. They've got experience with young people. They're professional coaches. We've trained them in our approach and we then onger, we give them ongoing supervision and training to make sure they're providing the best possible service for you. And we use a measurable goal-focused approach. We also do training and CPD for schools, webinars, masterclasses, inset days, consultancy and research collaboration. So we're always looking at what research we can publish um, to further the field of of research in this area. Um, this is a training that we've got coming up next week. It's a bit short notice, but if you know of a school that might be interested in this, um, please do let us know because it's coming up next week. It's in November, February and, and May. There's three sections to the training. We also have CIM Learning. There's a link to that on your handout. It's an online learning pl platform. Um, and we are on all the usual social networks as well. And finally, just to finish off, it's really important to say that what you've learned today is necessary for some so neurodiverse children really need this but all children need it so don't think about this as something just for neurodiverse children all children can benefit from a trauma-informed executive function approach thank you so much